So I'm about ready to begin. Um, thank you all for, for coming. Um, this is a, a, a topic basically uh, about uh, ADHD disorders in adults in the context of addiction treatment. Um, this is a presentation I have given a couple times the la last at um, a Cape Cod C4 conference this last fall. Um, uh, I'm a, a specialist in addiction medicine for the last 10 years. Prior to that, I was in family practice in rural Maine. Um, so I'll do the presentation and uh, try to finish it in about 15 minutes, and then we'll have uh, questions. Um, also, I'd call your attention to the fact that there, there's an evaluation afterwards that it's useful for feedback if you can hang around long enough to fill that out. And uh, the slides will be available um, on the uh, CSAB website. Um, so I have, we'll get started. I have um, obviously no commercial interest. So what we're going to discuss today is particularly how to deal with ADHD and a quest for ADHD medication in the context of a substance abuse treatment program. That's going to lead us into considering reconsidering adult ADHD and what that means, particularly in the context of um, substance use disorders, and try to make some connections between ADHD, um, our patients seeking stimulants and using stimulants, um, and uh, PTSD. In context, um, um, the uh, what I'm going to say about stimulants is probably has a lot in common with with the other classes of prescription medications with addictive potential when they're giving lo uh, long term, and um, the the most uh, well known of these are the opioids. Uh, which um, many patients become attached to when they're used to pain treatment, but in the long run tend to have lots of uh, serious problems over the years. And less so these other classes that are mentioned, the benzodiazepines and more of the new kid on the block, the, um, the high potency cannabinoids. And um, in the case of the cannabinoids, our patients uh, out their benefits for function and for, uh, for relieving anxiety, relieving pain. Um, I think they're doing a lot better on them, but, but in reality, they do affect them negative cognitively. They interfere with short-term memory, interfere with motivation and executive function, lead to increased frequency of um, motor vehicle accidents. Um, so the um, opioids and the benzodiazepines were kind of pushed by commercial forces, and we think particularly the Sackler family and their role in the Oxycontin epidemic. Uh, lesser known is that they also had a role in uh, making benzodiazepines uh, more widely known and available earlier than that. Um, this book uh, recently came out. It's not a book by a medical specialist, but rather a reporter, but it kind of details some of how ADHD medications got over pushed by pharmaceutical industries and, um, and got us to where we are in the United States today. So I, I, I recommend it as um, light reading. Now, we're gonna, the next few minutes, I'm gonna look at um, specific the pharmacology of ADHD medications. Um, and there's some confusion about names here because we're supposed to don't use generic names in these presentations, but the drugs are more commonly known by their trade names. So I'll try to sometimes refer to both of these to avoid confusion. I bet when I started doing this, I got confused myself by some of the names. So basically the schedule two stimulants, the ones we think of as more potent, more addictive. In the United States currently, there's only two classes, the amphetamines um, at the methylphenidate uh, class. Um, the amphetamines are represented by 
uh, the brand Adderall, which is a specific combination of amphetamine, salts, and isomers. And then a, the, the slow release, um, release dexamphetamine or Vyvanse. Um, then methylphenidate by um, the commonly known Ritalin. Vocalin is an isomer of Ritalin. And there's several other isomers out there too. Um, then the long acting form that's most widely used is the, the uh, osmotic release methylphenidate or Concerta. Um, both of these um, amphetamine salts and methylphenidate Ritalin have a older long acting forms that have kind of fallen into disfavor and don't really offer advantage over the slow release form. The long acting forms, at least dexamphetamine and the oros methylphenidate are, are really the recommended uh, for long acting forms. Then there's a group of um, non-stimulants that um, have also uh, been shown to have effect in adult ADHD that I list down below here with their uh, generic name on the left and the trade name on the right. Um, um, and these are not considered to be addictive and are not scheduled. Um, but atomoxetine or stratera is the most uh, widely used. And below the desipramine is a representative of the tricyclics, which if you're older like I am, you can remember when these were much more prominent in treatment of ADHD in both adults and children because of side effects, they've fallen out of favor, particularly in children. Um, so I'm gonna talk about these two uh, main classes, the amphetamines and the, and the uh, methylphenidate class. Um, the the um, amphetamines are based on uh, the phenylethylamine nucleus, which I give a picture of here, a benzene ring and a few carbons and a nitrogen atom in the end. So these are the basis of the neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine. So you see in the lower left here. Um, and the drugs, both uh, prescription and illicit, are obviously related to these neurotransmitters and look very similar. Um, the amphetamine I mentioned and bupropion or wellbutrin are the two prescription ones. Methamphetamine, of course, is also still available by prescription. The rest of these, cocaine, methamphetamine, cathinone is the basic ingredient bath salts, and then MDMA or ecstasy, or uh, uh, more thought of as illicit and abused um, congeners of, um, of this nucleus. Um, and then we go over to the um, methylphenidate class, and these structurally look very different. Um, and I put in fluoxetine or Prozac here, and you can see the similarity of methylphenidate or Ritalin and adamoxetine stratera to the fluoxetine structure. There's also some similarities to the tricyclics and amitriptyline and the antipsychotics, of which Thorazine is the representative uh, drug. And that's not surprising because these are all working dopamine receptors um, and the norepinephrine receptors. So the point I want to make here is that uh, methylphenidate and um, the amphetamines are uh, different classes of drugs. They have a different mechanism of action. The, the amphetamine is felt to stimulate release of norepinephrine and dopamine, um, whereas the methylphenidate blocks reuptake. So when the, the neurotransmitter is released, the dopamine is released into the synaptic cleft, it stays there a long time because it can't be sucked back into the, the um, neuron that spit it out. Um, so drugs that promote release generally are more likely to be addictive, and that's no surprise because we know um, amphetamines, Adderall, or is, is more addictive potential than methylphenidate. Um, the other implication here is that if we're looking at studies of effective, we can't because methylphenidate is effective 
um, then automatically the same thing is going to apply to the amphetamines. Um, so to move on into pharmacology a little bit, the side effects of stimulants. Um, I'm not going to go over every one of these, but um, certainly there, there's, there's cardiovascular side effects. And these have effects both on individual patient that may have underlying cardiac problems um, and population-wise. If we're giving stimulants to a million people in the country, increasing blood pressure by four points, that has an epidemiologic effect. Sometimes the increase in blood pressure is equal to what the blood pressure is being reduced by the uh, antihypertensive. Um, then uh, um, we'll talk about this, the sleep issues with amphetamines. Um, and of course, our concern in addiction, the issues of addictive potential, dependence, withdrawal, and, and uh, addiction. I also should mention the picking and formication, formication of feeling of crawling insects on your skin. Um, this is thought to be a side effect of methamphetamine and abusable stimulants, but I've certainly seen it particularly with amphetamines at, at regular prescription doses. So to move on, again, we, I think we kind of ignore the uh, sometimes the cardiovascular issues, with uh, particularly with amphetamine. This is from the package insert, the DEA, the FDA package insert. So, if we look at the first paragraph, says that talks about the relationship of um, cardiac events to to a treatment with stimulants, and it's, it concludes that also with the uh, underlying cardiac abnormalities such as coronary artery disease, very common in our patient, should generally not be treated with stimulant drugs. And uh, we look at the bottom section, it says if you're going to treat someone with stimulants, you need to do a careful cardiac history and physical exam uh, to assess for presence of cardiac disease um, and be on the lookout for symptoms. Um, in my experience, I have a lot of older patients on stimulants and I and they're, they're prescribed these without much attention being paid to this. Now, you may recall in Canada, um, amphetamines were uh, taken off the market for a number of years because of uh, the fear of these kinds of problems. Um, and a lot of my family practice colleagues, a number of them um, will not prescribe stimulants with a, a Schedule II stimulants for uh, worry about these problems. Uh, so why do we worry about stimulants? So this is a slide of, of, of manufactured, the, the amount of stimulants manufactured in the U.S. by pharmaceutical companies for prescription at the manufacturing level. Um, from a, a Arcos data set. Um, so this basically tells us in the, the the amount of stimulants manufactured in the U.S. was doubled in the past 10 years, from 2006 to 2016. The linear curve. So why, what is that driving that? And we look at the graph on the left here. This goes divides it by uh, stimulant class. So the top line is methylphenidate or Ritalin, which has actually stayed pretty constant over that decade. Um, then what's contributing most is, is the amphetamine. We see that rather steep rise. Then the next line down is the least X amphetamine. Whoops. Um, or Vyvanse. And that came out and, and took a little bit of time to get approved by insurance companies at a rather steep rise initially. And then it's, it's been flattening off lately. So most of the rise is coming from um, the short-acting amphetamines, Adderall. So who is getting these prescriptions? Now, now I move to the um, PMP, Prescription Monitoring Program data set from Maine. Um, the bottom line is a prescription to children under 18, the top line um, adults 19 and over. So most of the rise here is in, or all of the rise is in adults. Um, and if you follow this curve on from 2013, it continues to rise, although less steeply than down here. Um, 
So basically, well, this increase is represented by adults taking short-acting amphetamine. Um, so why is this going on? And I, I can't say I have any definite answers. I, I, from the, my own viewpoint as an addiction specialist, I have to link this to the addiction epidemic, the prescription drug addiction epidemic, principally opiates that we've been facing uh, in the nation in the last five to eight years. Um, the other concerning factor is fact is that this rise is driven by uh, short-acting amphetamine, Adderall, um, whereas the recommended treatments for adult ADHD for the longer acting slow release forms, at least dexamphetamine and the orosmethylphenidate or Concerta. It's the addictive drug that is driving the increase. Okay. So I'm going to move on into the clinical setting. So here is a typical case. Um, I kind of made this up. So it's a 26 year old coming into our intensive outpatient program. Uh, of, and he's going to be put on buprenorphine for um, opiate dependence with, from heroin. Um, and on the intake, he requests to be put back on Adderall for his ADHD. And he says he's been on it for a few years from his PCP, but due to his drug use, he lost contact with the PCP and therefore lost the prescription. Um, and he's been using street buprenorphine. Um, and by, by history and maybe by some features on exam, he meets the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD. And so what else might you wanna know? Um, his past history, he did have ADHD as a child, but was only on stimulants for a short time. Um, he had a disordered um, family with some post-traumatic stress issues. Um, that's urine, had buprenorphine, amphetamines, and marijuana. Um, says he's using the marijuana primarily to fight off withdrawal when he can't get buprenorphine. He did a PMP for the last, let's say the last two years, didn't find any sign of prescription ADHD medication. So the question we have, um, this raises, can we make a diagnosis of adult ADHD? Um, and should we give the stimulant medication? And if so, how do we decide when? So to answer the first question, um, the answer would be no, we can't because he's enter as, as he's entering recovery, a great number of our patients are gonna meet the criteria for ADHD. They're, they're gonna be disorganized. They're not gonna be able to um, multitask. The, the executive functions will be poor. They can be impulsive. Um, until their brain settles down, we, we can't really make a diagnosis. That's true for a lot of uh, um, mental health conditions. And we'll answer this second question as we go on. So this is a bibliography that I mainly put in here for you have access to it. Um, Cochrane has had three reviews relating to adult ADHD. Um, one with uh, reviewing amphetamines and one methylphenidate or Ritalin. Both of these get pretty negative reviews and, and um, negative in that the, they don't think there's evidence to support their use, not that um, they make ADHD worse or they're contraindicated. A little more positive with the review of the cognitive behavioral interventions, uh, the second one. Um, there, and then I missed some reviews that I found that I, I thought were pretty good and a very good discussion. Um, First one is the best, although it's getting dated, 2008. Uh, uh, I don't know what the author, Torgerson from Norway. Um, and he found 30, he found about 300 uh, good studies for, for children and adolescents, 35 only for adults, or 33. 28 of these were with methylphenidate and five or six with um, 
amphetamine. And the ones with amphetamine were not of great quality. There were often crossover studies, um, which was rather hard to blind the, uh, the drug, moving from placebo to an uh, active drug. Um, and I put down some individual studies here. Um, this top one was a presentation at ASAM a couple of years ago by Paula Riggs. Um, they took adolescents with, in treatment for substance abuse diagnoses, not opiate addiction, um, gave them all a, a kind of a prepackaged CBT program, gave some um, oral methylphenidate and some placebo for medication. And they found that um, the oral methylphenidate did not seem to provide any additional benefit over the CBT. It, the only benefit it provided was some subjective benefits, some self-report, uh, and the but in the actual functional benefit using functionally based ADHD scales, there was no benefit. And this has pretty much been found across uh, other studies that are looking at uh, treatment of ADHD in addiction treatment settings. Um, then the, the last study down here. Of, by Moffitt. Um, this is uh, one of three studies that look at to try to reconsider whether childhood ADHD is related to adult ADHD, what the relationship is. And all these three studies question that there's a relationship and rather suggest that these are two different illnesses. And uh, I was going to look at the Moffitt study in particular because it's a more of a prospective study. It looks at um, families, not just with ADHD, but a variety of conditions, and follows them from birth through adulthood, through young adulthood, um, which they can do in a, a country like New Zealand, which has keeps health records and whose residents tend to stay put. Um, so the findings of this study, surprisingly, there is almost no correlation between childhood ADHD and adult ADHD. The percentages of kids who had ADHD was comparable to that in other studies and the same with adults, but there was very little um, increase in, in, in frequency uh, whether if you had, had childhood ADHD or not. Um, adults who had a history of child onset ADHD most of them did not meet criteria for ADHD. They still carried some of the problems that their childhood ADHD had caused. Poor um, educational achievement, lower socioeconomic status, lower earning powers, and personal interaction problems um, that affected their ability to function. And, and perhaps in the United States, they might have been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, in contrast to the United States, in, in, in in common with most countries in the Western world, few patients here were treated with ADHD medication. Um, and interestingly, almost half of the adults with ADHD had a substance abuse diagnosis. This does not count tobacco, count mostly alcohol, um, opiates some, but this was before the opiate epidemic took hold even in New Zealand. Um, this goes against some other studies that do show a correlation. Um, but a lot of these studies rely on a history by adults recalling what happened to them in childhood, their ADHD experience in childhood. And we, we know that such recall can be rather selective and not reliable. Um, so what do we know about adult ADHD in general and its treatment? Um, I mentioned the, the poor correlation that we thought between child and adult ADHD. Most controlled good studies of ADHD treatment are in children, not adults. Um, the studies of adult ADHD treatment with stimulants show robust benefits, of, at least for the short duration of most of these studies. But these benefits are attenuated or non-existent when other diagnoses are combined with ADHD diagnosis particularly, as I mentioned, substance abuse disorders, which is what we're concerned with. Um, few adults in these studies continue their ADHD medication long term. Most of these blinded studies are unblinded. Patients continue to be followed 
only about a quarter of them continue their medication for longer than one or two years. And the studies that were observational studies, there's more like 50%. Um, why do they not continue the medication? I, and I don't think anyone has, has a good answer to that. One might be that they don't need it anymore, they got better. Some of it's side effect problems. Um, some of it may be the patients who are addicted had problems with their addiction, but I'm, I, I don't have, and I've not seen in literature a good answer to that question. And behavioral treatments um, have an equal benefit to medication. Unfortunately, we don't have any head to head studies, but we have add on studies. Um, and studies of behavioral treatments by themselves, so sometimes with a placebo. Um, and the quality of evidence for any medication for ADHD is poor. Now, that you could argue that doesn't mean that the medicine is not effective, but it means we don't have good support from studies. Um, so to move to speculate a little about what we're dealing with, with adult ADHD, particularly in substance abuse, um, we need to reconsider the idea that this is a lifelong personality trait um, and that it might be a more of an acquired condition. Um, and the Moffat article suggested that we maybe can think of adult ADHD as being different in those that have the substance abuse and those that don't. Um, in the US, um, you can't help but note that there might be some overdiagnosis of ADHD compared to European countries because the ADHD diagnosis is tied to receiving uh, the drugs that patients want or feel they need, maybe for performance enhancement. Um, and um, ADHD symptoms are often combined with other mental health disorders. Um, and you could argue that according to the criteria, for the DSM-5 criteria, if the symptoms are better explained by another diagnosis, you don't necessarily diagnose ADHD, but again, to get, you have to give them ADHD diagnosis. So that can crank the diagnosis frequency up. You can argue that Europe uses a different system. I looked at it, it's not that different. And it's perhaps a little more soft in terms of their criteria than ours is. Um, so going on to uh, substance abuse disorders in particular, um, ADHD medication provides subjective benefit, but in the aggregate, not any improvement in function. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy and other similar therapies are superior to medication for treating ADHD in a, in a substance abuse treatment setting. Um, but in the aggregate, um, giving ADHD medication does not increase harm to, to recovery. Um, although we have to individualize here because some patients may have benefit, others addiction may be adversely affected by the medication. Um, and we know that those who use illicit stimulants, who use street amphetamine or Adderall, are more likely to have addiction issues around stimulants than those who use it by prescription. This data largely comes from studies in college students. Um, that a student who takes performance enhancing drug to do better in his studies will do a lot better if it's prescribed than if he's getting it from a roommate. Um, then the, that brings up the thorny issue of those who are using non-prescribed stimulants, if we just gave them a prescription for their Adderall, would they not use these and would they function better and be okay? Um, unfortunately, that's not always true. And in my experience, more often than, it's than not, it's not true that those who are, you, you, you try to take away their, their misuse by giving a prescription, uh, the misuse continues either of what you're giving them or, or misuse off the street. Although many people are, are trying to treat stimulant misuse by doing this. NIDA has studied, extensively studied use of st uh, prescription stimulants to treat cocaine and methamphetamine addiction and results have been totally disappointing so far. Um, 
So we can look at ADHD and a lot of substance abuse diagnosis in the terms of um, sequelae of a, attachment disorder or the also the way it's looked at is the adverse childhood experience uh, model, which most of you may be aware of um, some of these. Um, And amphetamines are often sought by our patients to, to relieve, um, not for ADHD symptoms, but for, to make them feel better uh, because of a variety of problems that I list here and help self-treat anxiety, depression, um, phobias, poor motivation. And sometimes we see people latch on to amphetamines when their the drug of addiction is not there anymore because they're in treatment. So I'm not gonna go into the attachment theory too much, but um, basically the pays a lot of attention to the initial bonding between the child and the parent figures in the very early months and couple years of their life. And the unhealthy attachments lead to the ability to maintain relationships in adulthood, to, to, keep a kind of emotional equilibrium to not be um, always on the alert for danger to have PTSD-like behaviors. Um, and a lot of disorders in recovery uh, have, can be explained by attachment model and even treatment be approached that way, particularly effects of trauma, but certainly ADHD, personality disorders, fibromyalgia, a lot of mood disorders and anxiety. Um, not psychotic disorders. So recommendations, um, initial treatment of substance abuse with ADHD is directed at the substance abuse, of course, any underlying serious mental health issues and developing coping strategies for ADHD and PTSD um, rather than jumping straight to medication. And there are several models in which stimulants, prescription stimulants are not given until the person is stabilized in recovery and they might have need, even found to be needed at that point. Um, this is the model I use and I, th I think one paper uh, suggested waiting a year. It takes about a year for the brain to stabilize for the um, um, neuro hormones and transmitters to kind of reach an equilibrium. It takes quite a while. That's what we define as early recovery. Some of our local treatment programs don't allow any prescription stimulant use. But above all, don't get caught in the trap that because someone has an ADHD diagnosis that you agree with, that that automatically implies they need to be on medication. Um, our local VA here, um, when they get patients coming in wanting Adderall, they have a group, an ADHD group, that uses some of these behavioral models. They send them to the group. Um, and I don't know how many actually go. Um, and because self-reporting is rather unreliable in people in recovery that are taking a potentially addictive medication, the value of observation by family members and even by people who know the patient well, leading an IOP, I think has some, some value in considering the diagnosis and what to do. Um, so just some pitfalls here. Um, the patient insists that Adderall is the only thing that works for me. Uh, we heard that with the opiates. Um, very important is um, avoiding a pharmacological up or downer cycle. Um, in early recovery, it's very critical to get the patient's own uh, hormonal neurotransmitter environment back in order. So uh, the cortisol rises in the morning um, the norepinephrine rises and the melatonin is there at night and, and they have a normal 24-hour cycle and, and their kind of anxiety and emotions settle down, they can become normal. So the upper down cycle means someone who takes their Ritalin to get up in the morning and then takes a, two puffs of marijuana to go get to sleep at night um, or takes an Ambien. Um, Particularly pernicious is the relationship between alcohol and ADHD medication. Each use of each one tends to aggravate use of the other. Um, so 
I've mentioned some of these others. Um, um, to go down to immediate release versus the long acting, slow acting forms. The immediate release forms are well, not a good idea in substance abuse disorders because they're more abused. The amphetamine is popular by insufflation, the methylphenidate by injection, and um, bo both can be easily taken by patients uh, and just whenever they feel they need them to get rid of uncomfortable feelings, which we're trying to teach the patients to deal with, and both are widely diverted. So if we're going to prescribe stimulants, there, there's several things we can do um, down the lower line here. First of all, consider the non-stimulants that were listed, which although don't have a whole lot of studies, the studies do show a uh, beneficial effect. And particularly the Stratera, I think is underused. And we saw that it's um, related to the, the uh, SSRIs, uh, um, the Prozac family. Um, and then as such, it, it um, takes a while to get going. It takes a week or two to work. It doesn't work from the first pill. And these to be given an adequate dose, usually a hundred milligram um, daily dose at the minimum. Um, and then if you are going to use the Schedule II stimulants, use the uh, long acting forms, the uh, least dexamphetamine or Vyvanse and the Oros methylphenidate or Concerta. Um, these are less abuse prone or uh, taken once a day, um, not easily able to be injected or, or insufflated. So just to, there's a, this refers to a study of, of by a, some um, investigators in the Netherlands purporting that uh, good sleep is critical to um, restoring normal function in ADHD. Um, the, interestingly, the short-acting amphetamines are so more strongly associated with insomnia related to treatment than um, the other forms. And these are not compared head to head, but in different studies. So if you have a patient taking short-acting amphetamines, Adderall, um, and they're having trouble sleeping, you probably ought to consider switching to something else. Um, I skip over cases here because I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about PTSD and the amygdala. Um, so we, we know that the kind of the standard um, model for PTSD is, um, let's see if I can get the cursor to go here. The, the amygdala sits here, it's one of the midbrain structures and it's responsible for fight or flight response. It's responsible for being on guard because of the threat is perceived. So a stimulus either, in this case, an ocular stimulus will come in, um, the amygdala will consult the hippocampus, which is the seat of the emotional memory. And if um, this is perceived to be a threat, then the amygdala will fire up and um, drive the frontal cortex, which in normal cases is, is driving these midbrain structures and keeping them in check. So in, in PTSD, the, this, the amygdala is actually more sensitive and hypertrophied, is more ready to respond to one of these um, fight or flight stimuli from the, from the hippocampus. Um, so establishing some cortical control over the amygdala um, in recovery from PTSD is important. Now, I get this, let's go back. In um, ADHD, the pathology is not quite the same, but you still have the uh, issue of the prefrontal cortex trying to exert control over these midbrain structures that um, tend to drive behavior, particularly the uh, excitable and irrational behavior. And stimulants work, um, at least in part, by improving cortical, cortical function, by stimulating dopamine and norepinephrine in the prefrontal cortex. 
and reining in these other structures. So it's speculated, and I'm endangering speculation a little bit, but some of the authors I'm going to lead you into, or my source for the speculation, that the reason uh, patients with PTSD seem to get relief from stimulants is that they do enhance this cortical control and, and able the, the prefrontal cortex to rein in the amygdala. Um, so this is one of the authors uh, who um, is pursuing this, um, Stephen Ross. This is from uh, the Wall Street Journal. Instead of using amphetamine as a trial to treat PSD, for some reason, they, he jumped straight to ecstasy or MDMA and is doing MDA supervised treatment of PTSD. So this is now in phase three trials. Um, um, with this theory that I mentioned, that um, improving control over the amygdala through medication, through stimulant medication, is one way to treat PTSD. Um, so, I think when, uh, um, See, I also got a bibliography on this too here, which I'm not going to go into too much. There is just one study showing um, use of methylphenidate, this third one on the list, with a control of galantamine to treat PTSD. Um, I wish there were more such studies. This, this third one down is the one I alluded to, one of the using MDMA. And there's this one at the bottom, this, it's a very nice article talking about the association between PTSD, stimulant use, um, and addiction. Um, so what, how, how, what do we do here? And, and how do we make use of this? I think I gave you a, if you downloaded it, a, a handout on PTSD, a PTSD rating scale. So when I see a patient who's requesting stimulant medication in, in early recovery, I, instead of going down the, the, the list of criteria for ADHD, I say, why, what benefit is the stimulant giving you? Why do you want it? Um, sometimes I'll get a lot of items that come that fit in with this PTSD scale. Particularly the patient will say, um, I can't relate to other people. I feel detached. When I take a stimulant, I can talk to them again. Um, and then some of the hyperarousal symptoms, PTSD are listed here that are also shared with ADHD, hypervigilance, difficulty concentrating, irritability, difficulty with sleep, um, memory impairment. Um, but sometimes they'll, they'll give me a story of PTSD, not ADHD. Um, so, does that mean we should start treating our PTSD patients for their PTSD with stimulants? I don't think we have enough, I know we don't have enough data to warrant that. And uh, if we look down this caveat, the last line here, uh, in the past we thought benzos were the go-to drug for PTSD and then a number of studies show that they make PTSD patients refract, more refractory to treatment. But I think since we have to be aware of what we're treating um, and, and how much of what we thought was the ADHD is more driven by PTSD. And again, going back to the model of um, adverse childhood experiences that I alluded to earlier. Um, so I'm going to wind down here because without time for questions. Um, um, General conclusions so caution prescribing stimulants in early recovery, especially the Schedule IIs, um, the amphetamines, and the uh, methylphenidates. Um, treatment of ADHD does not imply prescribing medication. Um, it may imply it, but it doesn't have to. Um, and particularly avoid giving stimulants as part of an upper dial, downer cycle of medication. That is avoid stimulants in people who are regularly using cannabis, 
benzodiazepines, alcohol, Z drugs, and other multiple sedatives, and psychotropics. Um, avoid stimulants for life enhancement purposes. Um, um, and stimulant use disorder, unfortunately, rarely responds to prescribing Schedule II stimulants. Use the long-acting preparations that have been shown to be a benefit, the Oros methylphenidate and the Vyvanse, this dexamphetamine. Um, the older long-acting forms like the Ritalin LA and the Adderall long-acting Adderall or don't really offer benefit um, over the, the cheaper short-acting forms. So let's go to my cartoon. And ask, are you treating ADHD or PTSD? Um, I finish with a cartoon of ADHD, the, the all-important first date, the non-ADHD person and the ADHD person who's particularly not setting a stage are distracted. So I have 10 minutes now for for questions, um, so I'll open this up. So are, are there any questions? Um, if there's no questions, there's one thing I, I left out in an inch of time, but um, maybe want to go back to, and that is um, what what the heck is Concerta and why why is that the only long-acting Ritalin that works? Um, Concerta is a um, um, pulse-released capsule that instead of releasing a steady stream of methylphenidate, releases it in three pulses. It, it has two compartments that suck in water from the environment and push the medicine out a hole on the other end um, and three discrete pushes. Um, and the problem is if you give a steady stream of methylphenidate, um, the, um, dr the drug in the space that you're not letting re -up, so re uptake inhibitor, so the drug doesn't get reuptaked and there's no drug left in the terminal to push back out. So you keep giving the, the um, methylphenidate and it becomes less effective even though it's long acting. So you got a lot of rest period occur between doses. So they, some drug companies spent a lot of money, I can't remember which it was, making this pulse released form. Um, and it seemed to be effective. I can remember when it came out, it really, um, in kids, we didn't have to give um, methylphenidate throughout the day at three different doses. Um, okay. So we have a couple questions here. Um, and Vyvanse has the additional advantage of being a pro-drug. Now that's one of the great reasons, I think, that I like to use it. Um, um, it, it requires metabolism and actually in the red cell, um, if, you, if you grind it up and inject it or snort it, get very little benefit from it. Um, and patients, clever patients have been drug addicted, people have been trying to make it an abusable form and have not been successful. Are there specific programs, trainings that are CPD based to teach skills to adults? Um, that's a really good question. Um, um, I think the normal, we have a curriculum, at least we did at Mercy Hospital, a four week curriculum, which taught a lot of these skills, um, but I'm not aware of any that are directed to manage ADHD symptoms. There are some articles about approaches to um, ADHD purely from a um, psychotherapy for cognitive behavioral perspective um, that uh, they address both teaching patients how to 
to keep track of things, how to stay focused, and also to deal with the sequelae of HD on their relationships and their work and their schooling um, that create maladaptive behaviors. Um, uh, that's a good question. I, um, I would like to ask my VA colleagues what they do in their ADHD groups. Um, so how can clients in methadone treatment that abuse opiates and meth be helped to stop their stimulant abuse? Um, if you look at that, that Rublas article, they address that question. Um, again, they address it through, um, they find it through um, behavioral therapy uh, around the addiction and the ADHD that uh, stimulant use uh, can decrease or stop. Um, so I would say that uh, CBT approaches. And, and, and in the study, um, the, the Paula Riggs study, they did not even use a specific ADHD treatment. They just used an off-the-shelf CBT program which when you're doing a study, it's nice to use things that are neatly packaged. Um, but they showed ADHD benefit just from um, normal CBT. I know methadone clinics are difficult to do behavioral intervention. I don't work in a methadone clinic, but they're difficult to do behavioral interventions in because you've got to do that outside, generally outside the methadone clinic. Um, and you have problems with payment, and problems with patients going to two different programs. Um, but we do see a, patients in my treatment program that are maintaining methadone clinics and get their, their counseling and their group work through us um, and as a mental health diagnoses. Um, so uh, are there other questions? comments on my answers. Okay, well, it's um, about four minutes. So thank you for a great deal for coming. I, um, I think this is an important um, topic because you can't really deal with the, uh, at least the prescription aspect of the opioid epidemic without considering um, the other abusable substance and those substances are often given in conjunction with opiates. Um, oh, here's another question. How many patients do you lose from your practice when you refuse to get them their stimulant of choice? Uh, I do lose a few of them. Um, one of the cases I did not present in my um, was one such patient. Um, um, I, I do cave in some, if I, I had, did have one patient that I felt was really trapped and um, was abusing street stimulants and uh, was in an abusive setting where she couldn't get away from her abusers. And I ended up giving her, I, I did bend and give her stimulants outside of my the protocol I described. But I, I some I have lost, it's, They've not found it. This is Portland. There's a lot of providers here. They've not had trouble finding someone who will give them their stimulant of choice, which is usually um, amphetamine or Adderall. Um, but I still have plenty of patients in my practice. I, I still am not quite, quite busy. Okay. So I want to thank you for for coming and um, um, and again we have a, the the uh, valuation at the end if you want to hang around a few minutes for that. Um, um, enjoy talking and thinking about this topic, obviously, and um, and I think it's one of those situations where the. We're, the literature, we don't have good literature support what we're doing, and that doesn't mean that um, we're doing the wrong thing by prescribing stimulants, but we have to pay attention to what science tells us. Okay, well, so I'll just go ahead and sign off and say goodbye and thank you. And.